It's 10 to 3 on Wednesday the 26th of September 2018. That means it's the last Wednesday of the month and time for another bike news review. If you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles in the UK in the month of September, stick around and stay tuned. Hey kids, this is Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now as I say, it's the last Wednesday of the month again, which means it's time to review another four copies of MCN. I'm glad to say I'm recording this in the afternoon of Wednesday the 26th of September, so I've actually got all four copies from the month to go through. So uh, without further ado, grab yourself a uh, brew and uh, let's crack on, because there's quite a few stories to go through. So, first page to look at then, the first thing that I pulled out. Here we go, Livewire leads the charge. This is uh, Harley Davidson's Livewire, their entry into electric motorcycles. This is uh, a bike that they're looking to put into production in 2019. And uh, I don't know if, if you recall, but I was when I was reading this article, I was thinking, actually, I thought Harley already did an electric bike. But it turns out they don't. It's because, what I was thinking of was about in 2014, they did a bit of a world tour with, uh, with an electric bike, just to kind of gauge reaction and see if people were, were interested in them. Uh, it turns out they were, and they've come up with this now. This is the, uh, the production version, I think, of the bike. Looks great, actually, I must admit, it looks really nice. I can't wait to have a go if I can uh, on this bike. But uh, the point is, this, uh, this actually is completely different to the bike that they hoiked around the world back on that 2014 tour. It's only got something like 1% shared parts that that bike had, so it's completely different uh, to that machine. But it does look good, and uh, you know, I've said before, I'm a fan of electric bikes. I love internal combustion engines as well. There's always gonna be those in my garage, but uh, I'm not poo-pooing electric bikes. Um, can't wait to see some of them on the road and uh, you know, with good range, uh, and at good prices and then hopefully you know they can compete but anyway so the Harley Davidson actually that's one of the new Harleys I actually quite like the look of we shall see when it hits the market so that was the first thing next story I pulled out here over here uh, notwithstanding this uh, excellent blog off article that continues to be published in, uh, in MCN. If you don't uh, subscribe to MCN, then you're missing out on some uh, quality uh, journalism there every four weeks when somebody called the Missing and Fly does a little article. Anyway, but I digress. What I wanted to show you on this page was this picture here. This is the uh, Triumph Moto 2 um, engine prototype, if you like. This is the bike that uh, they've got the new Moto 2 engine in and they've been testing it. And um, basically, with it, it's, it's sort of a street triple uh, RS type frame with a with a fairing on it and some clip-on handlebars so it's kind of what you'd imagine a new Daytona would be like. Now a few lucky individuals got to ride this earlier in the month, a few select journalists and vloggers and so on, uh, and they all report great things as you would expect from it. It does look amazing and anyway the question is you know, will Triumph build us a new Daytona? At the end of the day, all they've got to do, of course, is stick on a pair of clip-on handlebars to a street triple and shove a fairing on, give it this fancy paint scheme, and away we go. I'm sure we'll all buy it. Well, I'd like to think we would, anyway. When I've spoken to Triumph in the past about this, the marketing guys there, they've said that uh, they would make it if they felt there was enough demand for such a bike, and uh, they've looked at other bikes, uh, you know, similar sports bikes that have been introduced, in particular the Yamaha R6, didn't sell many in this country, so they don't think there's demand for it. So we all need to uh, bang from the hilltops that we would actually buy this bike and then maybe Triumph would build it for us because it looks absolutely stonking as a sports bike, I must admit, really like that. So there we go, so that was that one. Uh, next article in the first paper, bit of a surprise as well since I rode this, here we go. Ah yes, 183 miles uh, per hour by the seaside is the is the title here. This is uh, the Brighton Speed Trials, I think they call it. And I wondered, or in fact, Brighton National Speed Trials, give it its proper title. I wondered if you went along to this and what you thought of it. Um, I've heard about it before. I always like all these sort of local events. I, I tend to forget that they're on until afterwards and I see the write-ups in MCN and wish I'd gone. This one sounds fascinating. 183 miles per hour speed runs down on Brighton seafront. Sounds absolutely brilliant to me. Um, the pictures look great, looks like the weather was good. Just wondered if you went, what you thought of it. And also, do you know how they actually do it? Because I read the article, but um, there's no mention in here about where the speed runs are actually done. Is it run down that bit of, um, you know, the promenade, just at the back of this, the, uh, the pebbles there at Brighton, or is it on a specific course? How does that work? I'll be interested to know, but uh, maybe next year, if I remember, I'll get along to the Brighton speed trials. That looks an absolute hoot of a day out. So uh, yeah, let me know if you've got any intel on that. I'd be interested to hear. Okay, next thing here from the letters page, and in fact this is just a generic point, this is the, uh, the week after the Silverstone uh, Grand Prix disaster when the, when the race didn't take, uh, go ahead because of the rain situation, or rather the new surface on the circuit not being able to shed the rain. So the letters page was absolutely flooded with what a disgrace this was. It's a real shame and a, a PR nightmare for Silverstone, who clearly 
you know, wanted a race to go ahead. A lot of people who put a lot of effort into this race happening. For it not to happen, for everybody to be disappointed, was an absolute choker. So, um, yeah, I can completely understand why everybody's moaning here. Nightmare if you spent a lot of money, time, energy, camping there maybe, or hotels, whatever, to get down to Silverstone to then not see any racing. Um, but uh, the race will be on at Silverstone again next year. Let's, fingers crossed, they're going to get good weather. Let's hope they sort out the track surface and let's get down there and support them because uh, it'd be a real shame if we lost the, uh, the MotoGP Grand Prix from Britain, wouldn't it? So, yeah, next year, let's give Silverstone one more chance eh? and uh, hopefully you know, they will, will have the problems fixed by then ok and then last from this paper is another of these um, bike battles that uh, MCN are so good at they've pitted here the uh, BMW R9T against the Norton Commando both beautiful bikes. I have ridden the R9T. I've never ridden any Norton. I'm not important enough, sadly. No, that's not, I don't mean that. I'm not, uh, I just haven't been in the position to ride a Norton. Uh, I'd love to. They just look incredible bikes. Anyway, they've done their usual fairly scientific comparison over the MCN 250 route, ridden both bikes. And basically, they, they love both bikes. But um, surprise, surprise, uh, the BMW R9T comes out on top, which in a, sh in a way is a bit of a shame. Uh, the R9T gets four out of five. The Commando gets three out of five. Um, the R9T being 12,400 pounds and the Norton Commander being 15,500. So three grand more for the Norton, yet it doesn't score quite so well. And I guess that's just you know a factor of the Norton being a low production run um, hand built machine, and the BMW being you know a factory mass produced machine, and they've got all the all the um, issues ironed out. So it's it's a, it's a real shame in a way to me as a, as an Englishman to see the uh, the Norton come second. Um, but you know, if you if money was no object and you had the choice of either, which one would you go for? I wonder. Without riding them, I mean, I like to think I would go for the Norton. Uh, no matter what it's like, really, I'd probably go for the Norton. But uh, interesting there on a bit of a scientific comparison, uh, it's the it's the R9T that wins. And I have to say, the R9T is a beautiful bike. I, I really enjoyed riding that. I'd have uh, an R9T as my as my next retro, over and above uh, the Triumph um, retro machines. And I love those too. But uh, I think the R9T, in particular, the classic one, the the original one that came out. Is a beautiful, beautiful bike. But the Norton looks beautiful as well, so it's a bit of a shame that uh, it didn't actually measure up to the R90 in that test. Anyway, there we go. That was just the first few items from the first paper uh, of the month. Next paper, again, five uh, things here that I want to quickly show you. First one, this is, you know, if you you will have heard of this because this is just something outrageous. This is the Romano Fanati um, situation that happened at the Misano Grand Prix, which I think was around after Silverstone. Incredible. This is the Moto2 race where Stefano, uh, sorry, Romani Fanati came up alongside another rider, uh, Stefano Manzi, uh, and actually applies his brakes because um, he's, he's miffed with him for some reason. At 140 miles an hour, he applies another rider's brakes. Absolute nut job. Uh, so, you know, no surprise that his team fired him basically, and no one wants to touch him with a barge ball now. So, it's absolutely ruined his career, at least for the time being. But this is just such a shocking thing to happen, isn't it? Somebody, you know, willfully uh, doing that. He could have caused, well, who knows what he could have caused. Absolute no place for that in sport. Sportsmen are supposed to be role models, aren't they? Particularly for, for the younger uh, riders out there. This sort of thing, absolutely disgusting. So, uh, I'm really pleased that they took swift action and uh, got rid of the guy. What a nutter. Anyway, thought it was worth mentioning that because it was all over the news at the time. Next story here, Kawasaki's racy new 125s and uh, Kawasaki have now got on the 125, I won't say bandwagon because I don't think they sell loads and loads of these, but uh, Kawasaki it turns out haven't had a 125 sports bike for, for some years, in fact it was since uh, 1994 that they last had one. Um, so now they've produced basically a Ninja 125 and a Naked uh, 125. Uh, they look really cool. Uh, the reason why I mention this is because I've been riding a few 125s of late. I've uh, just finished riding the Suzuki uh, 125, the GSXR 125, which is obviously the competitor for this. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time with it. It was a proper, proper sports bike. It looks like a GSXR, and uh, you know it was a lot of fun. So um, and I've got a video, a final video coming out on that soon, by the way. So stay tuned for that if you're in the market for a 125. I imagine the Kawasaki's are much the same. Uh, It'd be great if I could get myself a going one. I'm not sure how I could because unfortunately Kawasaki are one of those brands that don't talk to me, uh, don't respond to my emails, etc. Which is a bit of a shame because uh, it would be nice to have a have a ride on something like that. And 125s are quite hard to borrow from dealers to do reviews on because um, 125s, of course, are predominantly sold to people that are learning to ride and working up through the license um, um, procedure, if you like. Uh, and therefore they don't tend to have them as demos because they don't want the bikes crashed. Because the and these are people that don't have licenses, so they can't actually sign up. 
uh, to say that they can ride the bike. So it's quite tricky to borrow 125s from dealers. So unless uh, uh, you know Kawasaki will lend me one, uh, I ain't likely to ride one. But you never know, who knows what might happen in the future. Um, but it certainly looks a cool little bike, and if it's anything like the GSXR 125, great, great fun to ride, I'd imagine. Poo poo small CC bikes at your peril. Have a go on one. I think it's, it's so much more fun thrashing the nuts off a small capacity bike than it is going slowly on a big capacity bike. That's my view anyway, I, I really enjoy them. There's a place for all size bikes, of course, a lot of big bikes as well, but the small ones are great fun. Okay, next up here, um, this is a, one of those incredible uh, inventions. This one just made me laugh. New helmet boast built-in aircon is the, uh, is the um, headline here, and you can guess what it's all about. Basically, this helmet here from an American company called Feher, F-E-H-E-R, never heard of them before, have built this rather stylish looking helmet, it has to be said, complete with an aircon unit on the back. Now, this isn't something I think necessarily that we're going to want here in the UK. We don't often get to, well, this year we had cracking weather for it. Maybe we would want it this year. But normally, we don't get the sort of weather that requires aircon in your helmet. But I was just wondering, what the heck is this all about? Is this just a gimmick or is this genuinely something that uh, somebody would want? I'd be interested to hear from you if you're in one of the uh, hotter countries, one of my Australian or American viewers. Uh, is this something you're likely to buy? I mean, for me, I mean, it does look quite good. But for me, it's yet another thing to charge a battery for or another thing to plumb into the bike. It's just a bit more faff and a bit more hassle when you get on the bike so uh, I think not for me but uh, interesting that these new products come out anyone interested in buying one just wondered okay that was that one next up now this one I'm quite excited about total revamp for 2019 BMW S1000 RR this is the BMW flagship sports bike a bike that I rode um, a little while ago now probably about 18 months ago Beautiful, beautiful bike to ride. Uh, in fact, almost too good. Uh, and I think I said it was lacking in a little bit of character. It's a four cylinder, so super smooth, really fast, laden with uh, electronics, really, really nice bike. But the thing I didn't like about it was the looks of the bike. When you look at the bike at the front end, the current model, it's got that squinty front end with the asymmetric lights that BMW do on so many of their machines, including the um, S1000 XR, which otherwise would be an amazing bike and one I would probably buy. But I just can't get on with that kind of duck-faced asymmetric look. So I'm really pleased that here on the new, um, I think these are from the patent drawings. Yeah, these are CAD uh, images taken from the design patent for the new BMW. It shows that they've completely cleaned up the front end and they've got this symmetrical front end now. And it's, it looks absolutely beautiful, actually. If the real bike ends up looking like this, which I suspect it will, then this is going to be an absolute winner, I think, and fly off the shelves once again. This could put the BMW back at the top of the sports bike league. Really like the look of that, so we yeah, can't wait to see that out. Um, it's the 2019 bike, they're saying, so I assume that means we'll see it break cover in 2019, so we won't actually be able to buy it till 2020, perhaps. But, but really pleased to see BMW seem to be going symmetrical now. I wonder if they'll do that with the other bikes as well. Some of them look okay. The big GS, for example, looks okay in its asymmetric form, I think. Um, but the XR just doesn't, uh, and nor did the um, RR, I don't think, or indeed the R, <laughs> which is the sort of naked version of that, didn't look quite right at the front either. If they can do something with the front of that, they're gonna be onto a winner, I think. So that's good news. And in this week's paper, um, MCN have done one of their, again, one of their in-depth comparisons that I really like. They do these really well. It's, they do it on their, their MCN 250 route, the 250 mile route, so they can do exactly the same ride in exactly the same conditions with two different bikes. And here, they're comparing the um, BMW F750 GS uh, with the V-Strom from Suzuki. Um, and quite interesting findings, actually. I, I, I've ridden both bikes, lucky enough to have ridden both bikes, um, and I really like the BMW, and I really like the V. They're both very good bikes. You can't go wrong with either of them. It's often the case these days. I've said it before, there are no bad new bikes out there. If you bought either of these, you'd be happy with them. But for me, I personally would take the BMW over the Suzuki any time because it's laden with technology. It rides beautifully. It feels a little bit lighter to me. It feels like it goes quicker to me. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful bike to ride. So I was quite surprised when um, MCN actually put them at level peggings in terms of um, stars that they've awarded. Both get three out of five, which I thought the F750 would uh, wipe the floor with the V-Strom, but not so as far as MCN is concerned. When you read the verdict, um, uh, Adam Child here, the tester, actually says that, uh, you know, money no object, and if you want the best bike, then go for the BMW. But it's a close call, he's saying. Uh, he says that actually the BMW, after uh, a couple of hours in the saddle, starts to get a little uncomfortable, which I'm surprised about. But uh, but there we go. The, having said that, the V-Strom is very, very comfortable. Uh, but both great bikes, but uh, nice to see um, that review there, and a little bit surprised with the findings on that one. Okay, that's it for the second paper. Getting our way through. Uh, how you doing? You still hanging in there? Right, third paper then. Uh, and we store as we got on this one. Crikey, five stories to pick out of here again. Let's just have a swig of me water. Right, okay, first up. 
Here we go, saving us from ourselves. Now this is uh, what I thought was a hilarious story. There's a picture here of a uh, R1200GS Adventure riding itself. And uh, there were pictures, or videos rather, on YouTube of BMW testing this self-riding motorcycle. And lots of people commenting saying, what the heck is going on here? Why would you want a self-riding motorcycle? The whole point of uh, having a bike is the enjoyment of riding it, balancing it, etc. And I get all that, but actually, <laughs> when you look into what BMW are doing, they're not doing this because they want to make a self-riding motorcycle. They're doing it because they want to um, develop better safety aids. It just so happens in the process of developing safety aids, things like um, radar avoidance and auto braking and things like that, um, it just made sense for them to make the bike self-riding. It was very easy for them to do that. Effectively, what they're saying is, if we can make a bike self-riding and, and a bike that can recognize hazards and avoid them automatically, we can then use that to, as the basis of a safety system for a normal bike that's not self-riding, but the systems from the self-riding bike can be used to help avoid hazards when they come up. So actually, on the surface of it, it seems like a bit of a comedy story. It says here, it's not April Fool's, is it? Um, but actually, it makes an awful lot of sense. And this is stuff that's coming way down the line. You know, we're looking at probably five, six years before we see this hitting bikes. But, you know, I, th I think that the, the idea that a bike, if it saw you about to T-bone a car or something, could actually avoid that car for you, you know, and react quicker than you can. Well, that's got to be a good thing, isn't it? It reminds me of all the debates about ABS on bikes years ago, when everybody said, oh, I can outbreak ABS, I'm better than ABS. In the end, we all can't admit that ABS for the general rider is a great thing. So more safety aids, the better as far as I'm concerned. So uh, well done, BMW. It's a novel that they got this uh, self-riding bike, but we ain't going to see a self-riding bike uh, for sale, not from BMW at least, uh, for the time being. I'm glad to say. Okay, next story. Oh, <laughs> I couldn't go through this uh, news review without talking about the new uh, GS1250 that broke cover this month. Uh, I know I'm a bit of a GS fanboy and I get accused of that a lot, but you know I do love the, the GS. I have one, as you may know, if you watch my videos regularly. Uh, I've got the, obviously, the current uh, R1200 GS. Beautiful, beautiful bike. Well, they brought out a new version now with this fancy new um, valve technology uh, that they're calling shift cam. Basically gives you effectively two sets of valves, a high lift and a low lift set, depending on how much load you're giving the bike. And the first uh, test is starting to come out now. Here's a picture of the bike, in fact, on my screen. The only way you can tell um, by looking at the bike that it is the new one is the, um, uh, the cam covers here actually slightly different it's got a different uh, plastic shape on there there's just a little uh, that's slightly larger and l-shaped on the new bike and of course it says r1250 on the tank this is the rally version uh, which has got the small screen and the big seat but they of course make the standard version that looks much more like a familiar gs in fact if, you know if you just glanced at it you wouldn't know it was a new bike which i don't think is a bad thing because i personally have come to quite like the way the gs looks i think it's quite a handsome adventure bike so i'm quite glad they've kept with that style why why fix something that ain't broken so it's got the same frame i understand pretty much the same stuff it's got some more advanced electronics or they're giving you some more electronics to do with hill start control stuff like that uh, as part of the upgrade but the main difference is this new um, uh, shift cam technology and the fact that they bored the engine out slightly it's now a bit bigger it's a 1254 cc as opposed to I think it was 1150cc, something like that before. So it's a bit bit more powerful. Uh, it now puts out 134 brake horsepower instead of 125. Bit more torque as well. Sadly, I don't think it's any lighter, uh, which is a bit of a shame. But um, first reviews have come out of this now. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, in fact, because it's in today's paper, the first review. Uh, also alongside this, they brought out a new RT, um, which is... Uh, an interesting looking bike. I can't wait to ride this. It's got the same technology, the same shift cam technology. Uh, I loved the RT when I last rode it, but it was a few years back. So I'm currently talking to my friends at Barnstormer about riding the new RT as soon as it's out and hopefully riding the new GS, of course, as soon as it's out as well. And uh, they're on that for me. So hopefully, uh, I think about three to four weeks they hit the dealers. So I should get a ride with one then. It's gonna be fascinating to see what those changes are like. A bit more about that in a minute when we look at the, uh, the first reviews that are coming out. Okay, next item here, uh, Manchester Bike uh, Safe. Bike Safe hits Manchester, is the um, little story down here. Now I mentioned this because I did the Bike Safe course with the Metropolitan Police uh, this winter just gone, or about January time I think it was, or it might have been earlier. Anyway, you can see my videos on how I got on. I thought it was great. I think it cost me something like 70 quid to do the Metropolitan Police one. The Manchester one, however, the good news is, it's absolutely free of charge. You just basically sign up and go along and join the Bike Safe course. So if you're in the north of England uh, and you've not done one of these courses, uh, what harm can it do? It's not going to cost you anything. It's a day out riding with the police. Uh, I think you might learn something, uh, and there's, you know, there's no, uh, you can't argue against more training, can you? Whether you agree with it or not, and the, and the, um, you know, 
the way they do it, whether you agree with that or not. It's neither here nor there. It can't do any harm as far as I can tell. I really enjoyed it. I learned a few things um, and it was great. The Met Police one, I'm sure the Manchester one is much the same. So it's free of charge. Check them out, www.bikesafe.co.uk and search for Greater Manchester if you want to get yourself signed up for that. Thoroughly recommend that. Okay, next story here. Uh, blog off. Okay, so this is uh, this is the blog off column uh, by somebody called. I don't know who this fellow is actually. Nick Barkley of Biker Glory. I guess he's a uh, a blogger in the in the normal sense. I write stuff down as opposed to doing videos like I do. A vlogger. Um, so anyway, he has a blog off column as well as I do uh, every month in MCN. Uh, and this one uh, piqued my interest because he's talking about is there a new bike conspiracy? And he's the point he's making is. Um, you know, new bikes, they're all very fancy, but actually when you look at the bare numbers, the performance, etc., they're not much more performant than they used to be 10, 15 years ago, which is a very interesting point and a good one. Um, and, I, and linked to that, it made me think, it's one of the things that I often think of when these new bikes come out around about this time of year as we lead up to the bike shows, um, there's a lot of hype, isn't there? There's all these... Um, articles in the magazines and the papers about the new technology. We all get excited about seeing these bikes and riding them, but actually, when you ride them, yes, they might be incrementally improved, but they're seldom you know, game changers. I mean, even the new GS, I imagine, isn't gonna be a step change. I don't think, although I'm sure it's a better bike than the one I have, I don't imagine I'm gonna be going out and buying one quickly, because it's gonna cost me 10 grand extra just for a bit of um, clever valve technology, but again, more about that later. Anyway, very interesting uh, what Nick Barkley says here about the, you know, is there a new bike conspiracy because performance hasn't changed much within 26, year, 26 years, I think he talks about. Um, and he may have a point there, he may have a point. And uh, I guess th the point I'm making is, don't feel that you have to buy a brand new bike to get fun and have a great uh, time with motorcycle. If you're new to biking, you're just getting into it, check out the second hand uh, bikes that are out there. There's some fantastic machines around. You don't have to buy the latest and greatest, which are, let's face it, very, very expensive. Even second hand bikes now are expensive, but uh, you know, don't poo poo an older bike. If they've been well looked after, no reason why you can't have a lot of fun with them. Okay, last article in this paper, before we move on to today's. Uh, one year on, uh, Indian Scout 60. Now this is a lady that uh, MCN have uh, interviewed. She's called uh, Cindy Powell, apparently. She's 45 from Maidstone in Kent. And she's, uh, she's just bought herself, or she's got, sorry, after she's had for a year this Indian Scout cruiser type bike. The reason I mention this is she's come from smaller bikes, um, sports bikes, I think Sports 125s actually coincidentally, having just spoken about them. Uh, but she's basically saying she loves this bike and it's the way to go now, she's a bit older and a bit achy and all that sort of thing. And we hear this we hear this a lot, don't we, from uh, older riders. Well, I'm an older rider myself, I'm a lot older than she is. Um, but uh, and, and I love sports bikes as much as the next man, but I must admit, whenever I get off my Panigale and jump on, say, my street triple, oh, it's so much more comfortable. And it does make me wonder, having uh, ridden a few cruisers of, of late, of which more later, um, whether buying a cruiser is inevitable for us all. Do we all end up buying a GS or a cruiser or maybe and a cruiser? I don't know. Uh, I haven't bought one yet, but I must admit I'm kind of going that way. I do. I'm starting to see the uh, the attraction of cruisers. Anyway, that's certainly what Cindy Powell at 45, possibly a little bit early for my taste to do that. But uh, but yeah, cruisers, maybe it's inevitable we all go that way. I'd be interested to hear your views on that one. All right, that's it for that paper. How are we doing? Uh, according to the camera, I've been on for 23 minutes. Goodness me, better get a move on then. Last paper is this one, came through the letterbox today. Um, so first story here, I've obviously just flicked through this paper this morning. I haven't read it in depth, of course. And it's this first story here um, that caught my eye. The, um, the story is 2019, the year of the true adventurers. And it's got a picture here of a KTM on it, but it talks about uh, all the big adventure bikes. But the bit that interested me was that, that they're saying is, um, the 1250 GS launched, um, BMW announced that uh, at the same time as that bike, or pretty much at the same time, they're gonna be releasing the new GS Adventure as well. Now normally uh, what BMW do is they'll release a new GS and then it might be eight, 12 months later before you can get the GS Adventure version of it. So this is gonna be great news for people that like the, the bigger adventure versions. Uh, they're saying it's gonna come out almost at the same time as the as the standard bike. And the same goes for the F850 GSA as well. The F850 being the sort of middle sized GS range. Um, they're bringing out an uh, adventure version of that as well, and that's gonna come out at around the same time. So fascinating. Hopefully we'll get to see all these at the bike shows. Um, but anyway, there we are. If you're, you know, if you're holding off, waiting for a GS adventure, it might be coming sooner than I certainly initially thought. So look forward to seeing those as well, seeing what they do with that. I assume it'll look much the same as the current one based on the standard bike. Okay, second story here is entitled Safe Southerners. This one amused me being a southerner myself. And it turns out apparently that motorcyclists, according to a, a new study uh, in the Southeast are the safest in the UK uh, because, and this is defined as, 92% of them have said that they were accident free in the past 10 years. <laughs> now to my mind, that means 8% 
had an accident in the last 10 years, so I'm wondering, is that a good stat or not? I don't know, maybe it is. Uh, next up, next safest was uh, Yorkshire and then Humberside. But it got me wondering, why is it that the, the bikers in the south are, are safer than the rest of the country? And I, I put it down to two things. One, it might be because their bikes get stolen frequently, so they can't ride the things, that'll make them safer. And two, uh, probably because we've just got rubbish roads around here. I've, again, I've said this before, but uh, in the southeast, there's so much traffic, there's not that many good roads. Yes, there are a few, I'm sure some people will tell me, come and ride this road, it's a cracker. There are a few good roads, but the traffic as well is so heavy down here. I just don't think we've got the, uh, you know, the miles under our tyres down here in the southeast, or we're riding in amongst traffic slower speeds, and therefore we're not having spectacular crashes, like you might expect if you're riding, I don't know, in Wales or Scotland or up north, where there's much more open um, countryside and you're more likely to wander on. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, just interesting that that's the stat that's come out. Um, there we go, interested to hear your view on that. Okay, next up. Number three here, new Indian Pax track pedigree. Now this is the uh, new Indian FTR 1200. Oh, that'll be my phone, let me just get rid of that. This is the new FTR 1200 um, that has been announced by Indian a little while back. They produced this prototype that looks absolutely fantastic. Well now the patent drawings have come out and shows us that actually the, the production bike is gonna look pretty similar too. Um, the production bike, according to the patent drawings, actually has an underslung exhaust rather than this high level one, which is a bit of a shame because I think this makes it look good. It makes it look almost scrambler-esque. But other than that, it looks fairly similar. So um, really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, I've never ridden an Indian of every type. In fact, I've never ridden an American motorcycle, I'm ashamed to say. Don't get me started on Harley Davidson's. I must get that sorted. I will get that sorted. Um, but when this comes out, I really want to go on this. This looks a really, really lovely machine. Uh, it's going to be, they reckon, about 14 grand uh, competing with um, things like Ducati Monsters. So that's the sort of territory they're aiming at. I imagine it will sound awesome. Uh, can't wait to see that in the flesh. So that's the new uh, Indian flat track of the FTR 1200. Don't know when we're going to see it. Don't think it says here. I mean, if concept at the moment, I imagine it's going to be a year or two before we see that actually in, this, in the showrooms. Okay, next one, uh, Racers Wow at Ali Pali. This is the new Alexandra Palace MCN show. I don't, don't know if you went, I didn't go to this. Uh, I seem to remember there used to be a show at Alexandra Palace and then it kind of stopped and now it's back again. And it seems to be badged as an MCN one actually. I just wonder what your view was on bike shows generally because we're getting to that, uh, you know, that time of year, aren't we? We've got the um, Intermop coming up in Cologne. I think it's the first big major one. Then we've got the NEC show, of course, in November. Uh, and then we'll have the other London show um, in February, I think that one normally is. Just wonder what you thought of them. I've been to quite a lot of these shows the last few years. I've been to the NEC show in particular. Um, start my computer again. Been to the NEC show in particular for about the last five years running. Um, this year, I'm not sure if I'm gonna go because it's always the same sort of thing. And um, I'm not in the market for buying a new bike. Um, so there's nothing in particular that I want to see. Um, but um, there's something about the, these shows that, number one, they're quite hard to get to, particularly the NEC one, it's quite difficult to get into, park, etc. But also it's quite expensive. I think last year the tickets were something like 17 quid, then you've got to pay another tenner for parking, plus you've got to get to Birmingham, a bit of a way from me, you know. You're looking at a whole lot of 50 or 60 quid to go to these shows, and basically when you go to the show, they're just trying to sell you stuff. Um, I think they should be free to get in. Um, I mean, the exhibitors are paying the show organisers to be there as well, so they win on every count, don't they? So there we go, so interesting. And the other thing um, about the shows, other than stuff for sale, there's not much at them. I know they try and do these things like they have, this looks like it has sort of like a drag strip, and I know at the NEC show they have sometimes like an off-road bit and stuff like that, but for me, they don't, they don't grab me, they're not things I particularly want to see. Um, so, and, and also, and this is where it gets a little bit, um, I have to be careful, uh, I think they're missing a trick not having YouTubers at these shows. A lot of other trade shows have YouTubers and you can go and meet them and shake hands and have a selfie and all that sort of thing. That doesn't happen at the bike shows, they just, I don't bear these people any ill will, but they drag out the same people all the time. So people like um, John McGuinness, who is a lovely fella, uh, I'm sure, I bear him no ill will whatsoever, but John McGuinness, Carl Fogarty, um, Steve Parrish, you know you know the crew, there's, um, there's loads of them, aren't there? There's five or six people they always um, take to these shows. I'm sure they're all lovely blokes, but they're the same five or six people every single year doing the same thing. So um, for, again, for that, that for me doesn't really appeal. It would appeal to me if I could go and meet um, Raw Jordanian or, or Baron Von Grumble or something like that. Anyway, uh, this year at the NEC, by the way, there are, I, hopefully I'm not um, speaking out of turn, but there is uh, a little bit of a, a move to try and get some vloggers there. I've certainly been asked if I want to go along. So just got some um, uh, logistics to sort out because I'm going to be actually out of the country for the first part of when that's on. But uh, maybe I'll be able to get there. If I do be, uh, if I do get the NEC show, I'll let you know all about that. So uh, it'd be great to actually meet you uh, and also find out who else from the vlogger sphere here in the UK is going. So anyway, interesting to know what you think about shows and uh, whether you know having vloggers there would be a good thing 
as far as you're concerned. Okay, um, and then last but not least, what's the time? I don't want to make this go on too long. The first um, GS1250 review has aired. So uh, here we are, MCN have ridden it. And uh, I guess no great surprise to me at least that they, that they love the bike. Um, they say that it's gruntier. They say that the, as much as you try, you can't tell that, that um, you know, the clever valve changing is happening when you put on the beans it just feels faster you can't there's no sort of step in power it's just been done so you can't tell the difference and that's got to be the right way hasn't it that's uh, that in itself is a good thing i think uh, and yeah overall uh, they say it's a lovely bike there's uh, as i say some extra electronic bits and pieces you get for it uh, and the reviews seem to be good what i would say is the cost of it is pretty expensive uh, don't be misled by the cost of the bmw tell you so for example the base model 13400 pounds you know yeah 13 and a half grand for that bike that sounds all right. It's a, it's a, you know, a nice bike, big bike, lots of technology. Thirteen and a half grand sounds about right. Ah, that is the basic bike, typical BMW style. If you want the one with the bits that you like to want, things like, um, you know, the electronic suspension, the TFT. Although I think the TFT comes with all of them now. Um, cruise control, heat your grips, stuff like that that you're going to want on this sort of bike. Then you're going to want the TE spec. Everybody buys the TE spec. I bought the TE spec. And the TE. £16,500, suddenly starting to get expensive. If you want uh, luggage on it, that'll be another thousand quid plus. So suddenly 17,500 for a standard, uh, well not standard, the TEGS. So knocking on the door of 18 grand for that bike, that's an expensive machine, isn't it? The GSA will be even more. So yeah, expensive bikes. Uh, it seems the prices have gone up a lot. We talk about prices quite a lot on this segment, but uh, to me, it feels expensive. The other odd thing with it is um, the brakes on it. It turns out some bikes are gonna have Brembo calipers on the front, some are gonna have BMW branded calipers. Can't find out any reasoning why. I did uh, send a little message to MTN and asked them about this and uh, my favorite reviewer, uh, Michael Neves, responded saying that that was indeed the case, but he didn't know, he didn't know why. It's very odd, isn't it? But uh, maybe we can get to the bottom of that at some point and uh, find out if these BMW calipers are any good. Certainly if I was gonna get one and, and they're paying knocking on the door of 18 grand, I'd want Brembo calipers. Anyway, there we go. So that was it for the uh, for the review of the papers. A few parish notices for you. If you're a fan of the channel, just thought I'd let you know a few things that are going on. Right. Oh, first thing, must just say as ever, thank you to Custom Fit Guard for the sponsor of this video. They make these little um, earplugs that you see me wear on my tours, for example, the Norway tour that's currently going out. Um, go and check them out, www.customfitguards.co.uk. Uh, and if you use Flyer 10, you can get a discount on them as well. And I'll be putting another little video about that uh, just before the NEC show, so look out for that one too. So thanks to those guys for sponsoring this video and my live streams. On the subject of sponsorship, I'm pleased to announce uh, I've got a new sponsor on board, or will have from next month, from October. Um, they're my friends from uh, Canary Motorcycle Tours, in fact. Um, so if you start seeing a new logo uh, knocking about on my videos, that's what that's all about. From October onwards for six months, I'm gonna be uh, sponsored by Canary Motorcycle Tours. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have them on board. Thanks guys for supporting the channel. Can't wait to come out and see you again soon. And uh, uh, really great that you're sponsoring the channel as well. Really chuffed about that. So that's what's happening there. If you see their logo a bit more around my channel at the start and finish. A um, few things that are coming up on the channel just to let you know about. Uh, of course, more adventures in Norway. I've still got, I think we've just done episode seven on Friday, episode eight. There are 12 in total. So a few more of those to come. And I think that tour gets better. Particularly, in fact, when we come back through Germany, because it sort of moves from being just a wow fest of amazing scenery to actually very interesting from a historical perspective. I actually go to Belsen, uh, the, um, the Nazi camp there, which was a fascinating visit and, uh, and other places too, but I don't bring the level of this, this uh, broadcast down, but uh, I think you'll find that fascinating. I certainly did. So do keep watching those if you're interested in the touring videos. Uh, I've got a review of the Yamaha SCR 950 coming up, which is, which is a sort of a cruisery type bike. Um, got another Reader's Rides actually coming up, which, um, which is a great one. Uh, really enjoyed making this one. That's coming out on October the 15th, so look out for that one and a few more lined up as well. Um, I'll give my six year ownership review of the Street Triple. I can't believe I've had that now for over six years. In fact, I'm a bit late with that review. Uh, that's coming up soon. Uh, my next live Q&A, if you want to make a note of this, if you want to watch the live uh, stream that I do once a month, that'll be on October the 17th at 8 p.m. UK time. Last one went very well. I'm chuffed with the comments and feedback that I get from those. So thank you for, for watching those, either live or the recorded version. But if you want to see it live, October the 17th at 8 p.m., that one's coming up. 
Um, I've got a review of the Husqvarna 701 Supermoto. In fact, several reviews. I've got that bike at the garage at the moment. Brilliant fun bike. Um, so I've been doing my usual stuff with that. I've got a long-term review, uh, initial thoughts, etc. That's all coming up. And also, uh, I've ridden the BMW F750 GS. I rode the 850 GS a few months back. I've now ridden the more road-focused one. Uh, again, that video coming up soon. And loads more besides. And before I uh, finally, finally sign off, uh, just a couple more things. Um, Oh, hey kids, <laughs> that stays. Uh, you may have thought that I'd lost it at the start of this video. I'm just trying out doing the hey kids thing after the little sting at the front, see what, what difference that makes if you're interested in anoraki type things. Um, but uh, everybody, well not everybody, but when I mentioned that I was getting a bit of flack for the whole hey kids thing at the start of my video, uh, I had an overwhelming torrent of support to keep it. So hey kids is staying, uh, and to celebrate the fact, there is now a hey kids t-shirt available on my Teespring uh, page. So uh, if you're interested in supporting the cause, putting a, you know, one up to the haters, then uh, get yourself a Hey Kids t-shirt. I shall probably be wearing mine on the next one of these videos. So that's there as well. Uh, and that's pretty much it for this time. I hope that's been of some interest to you. Um, if you want to know more detail on any of the stories that we covered in MCN, of course, I've just scratched the surface. I think it's a great read. Uh, it's what I use to keep up to date with everything that's going on in the biking world. Get yourself a copy of MCN or get yourself subscribed. That's what I do. They just prop through the door every week and uh, seemingly cost nothing because I don't remember setting up the direct debit, but I'm sure I must have done. But anyway, yeah, read up more on MCN. Back issues available if you want to. And, uh, you know, that's the way to get fully up to date. Anyway, that's it for now. Hope that was of some interest. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Missing and Fly. Cheerio.